Uh, as this is the last Aspie luncheon series before, uh, before uh, Christmas, I'd, I'd just like to start by thanking Peter and his team at Aspie. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank Lynn, Kian, uh, and Luke for the effort that goes into these events. Uh, congratulate you on the quality of the speakers at this year's uh, series and for making HP sponsorship so valuable. I also want to acknowledge the important work that ASPE undertakes, uh, valuable forums for discussion for important issues like this one today, uh, and the independent advice on defence and national security uh, that it provides to policymakers and to the broader community. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police, Tony Negus, and other esteemed guests here today. Today's topic and, and speaker is a highly relevant one for us at HP. Cybercrime and cybersecurity uh, deserve to be elevated to become issues of national importance. In October, HP released its, um, its third in a series of annual surveys conducted by the Ponemon Institute on the cost of cybercrime to the American economy. According to this study of US companies, the occurrence of cyber attacks has more than doubled over a three year period, while the financial impact has increased by 40%. The study found the average annualised cost of cybercrime across those companies surveyed was a staggering $8.9 million per company. This represents a 38% increase over, uh, over the figures in 2010. When you think about the unemployment in the US, that's a, a staggering number of jobs across the US economy lost. This year's study also revealed a 42% increase in the number of cyber attacks with organisations experiencing an average of 102 successful attacks per week, uh, compared to 50, 50 attacks in, in 2010. So HP agree wholeheartedly that it's a significant economic and national security issue worthy of attention. We also agree that it's a shared problem that requires government and industry to work closely together to resolve. We look forward to Roger's address today, which after hopefully not stealing any of his thunder, brings me to uh, today's guest speaker. Mr Roger Wilkins is the Secretary of the Attorney General's Department, a position he has held since September 2008. Prior to his appointment as Secretary of the Department, he was the Head of Government and Public Sector uh, for uh, Australia and New Zealand with Citibank. From 1992 to 2006, Mr Wilkins was the Director General of the Cabinet Office in New South Wales and also held the position of Director General of the Ministry of Arts in that state from 2001 to 2006. He was appointed an, an Officer of the Order of Australia in 2007 for service to public administration and on that, uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Roger Wilkins. Thank you. Thanks, David. And thanks, uh, Peter. And um, it's encouraging to see such a wide range of uh, professionals and interests dotted around the, the room. Um, I'm going to talk to you... Uh, roughly speaking, about cybercrime, I'm not really going to define what I mean by cybercrime, and we can have lots of metaphysical debates about what that is later, because in my experience, you could spend uh, most of the afternoon talking about what that is. But I'm just going to sort of leave it at large, and I just want to hurry through a few observations, um, um, which might start some, generate some discussion and debate um, in the room, um, hopefully. Uh, we don't yet have the, the white paper that's been promised on this subject, but I understand it's imminent. And notwithstanding that we haven't got it, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what I think um, a strategy um, around cybercrime might look like and what the essential components of that might be. And some of what I've got to say is probably, um, um, I'd just like to acknowledge Tony Negus, my colleague, Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police, um, especially because they've just had a great win in terms of what I think it's called Operation Lino, is that right, Tony? With uh, recent arrests in Romania, which is a terrific piece of work, a very involved piece of work, and for people who are interested in the complexity and the difficulty of pursuing cybercrime in the 21st century, it's probably a textbook case to have a look at that and have a look at some of the, um, some of the uh, complexities around the, the actual operation, what it involved, the level of cooperation, the level of effort that was involved. Um, because I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difficulties confronting law enforcement agencies. But the first observation I want to make is quite Simple. We should be very careful, I think, about thinking of cybercrime as some new sort of crime, rather than as old crime carried out in a new way. 
Um, and the same goes for a whole lot of other transactions on the internet, which I constantly keep hearing because I've got copyright and things like that in my portfolio. But we should be careful about thinking of cyber banking as some new sort of banking or thinking of cyber pornography as some new sort of pornography or cyber bullying as some new sort of bullying. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because there's a tendency to want to create new rules and regulations to deal with these new, in inverted commas, activities. And I should know because I sit around the SCAG table on a regular basis and hear that we need a new law on this, so we need a new law on that. So I think it's a, an important corrective to say that uh, we don't want to have two systems of laws and two systems of rules, one for cyber and one for physical space. And we don't want to gum up, more importantly, we don't want to gum up the internet with red tape. I think there's an important, important onus on people in public policy positions like myself, but people who can influence public policy like you guys, um, to understand that the internet works mainly because it's untrammeled by rules and untrammeled by those sorts of constraints. And we need to be very careful about interfering with that, the freedom of the um, freedom of movement on the on the internet. So the internet is a truly global phenomenon. It's uh, a true global mechanism for social and economic transactions. And we should be very careful about impeding or destroying or compromising that. It's what we're more likely to discover, I think, is that there are state-based rules and laws that create impediments to the free use of the internet. Uh, for example, the rules of contract, the rules of defamation, maybe intellectual property rules, differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And so may the rules of evidence and procedure and enforcement of the law. And how we deal with this sort of phenomenon is not going to be simple. To some extent, the internet and the global market will itself deal with these differences through processes of forum shopping, competition, what I call regulatory arbitrage, it's a bit like, uh, you know, the finding the, the flag of convenience. And people will choose where they prefer to locate or where they prefer to transact. So the pressure will increasingly be on nation states, and in particular, on secretaries of attorney general's departments to either enter into multilateral arrangements for an agreed approach to, say, intellectual property or pornography or banking or defamation or whatever, or to concentrate on refining and agreeing at least what we call in law the rules of private international law, the choice of law rules, so we know which laws are going to apply under what circumstances. Uh, or to attempt to regulate the internet through the imposition of domestic law, or some sort of combination of all of those things. Um, so one example fairly close to home, we are currently looking at imposing obligations on ISPs. This is something that's before the Parliament at the moment, uh, to maintain the safety and security of information of Australian citizens, governments and businesses. And um, we want, also want ISPs to be able to respond to lawful uh, requests for information under warrant. And uh, it will eventually be, perhaps, under that regime, a condition of doing business in Australia, that ISPs are able to meet those obligations and that they don't enter into arrangements, whether they be sort of arrangements with uh, the purveyors of cloud computing or whatever in other jurisdictions, but they don't say, well, um, it's impossible for us to deliver that information under warrant because, uh, I'm sorry, but we've stored our data somewhere where we can't get hold of it or where the laws of the jurisdiction uh, concern don't allow us to produce that information to an Australian court or an Australian intelligence organisation or to the AFP. So that's a live issue which is being discussed um, right now in the Australian Parliament and it's a sort of a microcosm of the type of issue that I'm saying is sort of uh, with us in terms of uh, the, the, the way in which we treat the internet. The second observation that I want to make is that even though cybercrime may not be a new sort of crime, there are features of the internet that render traditional modes of law enforcement problematic, in some cases impossible, 
Uh, I'm sure that my colleagues from the AFP and other law enforcement agencies around the room would say it makes it extraordinarily difficult. What are those features? Well, clearly the volume and speed of transactions uh, made possible by the internet can be a problem. We talk about I've heard people talking about industrial industrial modes of crime or mass crime, mass fraud, shutting down sites, shutting down infrastructure. The scale is something new. The scale of activity is something new. Then there is the anonymity of the internet. That can also be a problem in figuring out who is responsible for certain actions. Um, the global reach of the internet can be a problem, where actions emanate from another country or another jurisdiction, perhaps a relatively lawless and unregulated jurisdiction. And then there's the complex routing of transactions that can often make it nigh impossible to attribute causation to anyone or any organisation to figure out actually where the thing came from. Um, the comparative simplicity of hacking into systems broadens the scope of crime and criminals uh, and beyond you know, the normal type of motivation of financial gain even to hacktivists and lone wolves, people who do things for the heck of it, and can actually um, create enormous problems in terms of the integrity of infrastructure, etc. Also remember that most of the key assets in cyberspace are not owned or controlled by governments, except maybe in this country we've got the NBN, but apart from that, in most countries, they're not, and very often not owned and, um, by um, people or companies that exist within the jurisdiction itself, so it's owned offshore. So if you consider these features of the internet, then there are several challenges for conventional criminal law and law enforcement. Uh, let me contrast, just list some of those features which I think are most problematic. The criminal law does not really entertain the idea of acting to prevent a crime. You can't act to prevent a crime. It's a fundamental canon of criminal law that you can only be arrested and charged once you've done something wrong. Now, you can squeeze out the scope of that a bit by appealing to the laws of conspiracy and the statutes give you a little bit of room to manoeuvre in terms of preventive detention or maybe getting an injunction to prevent a, a crime under certain circumstances. But fundamentally, the criminal law says, until you've done something wrong, uh, you can't do anything to me. Then you've got um, the criminal law also requires proof beyond reasonable doubt. You cannot act against someone on the basis of intelligence alone. You require proof on the basis of admissible evidence, which is quite different to the type of information that, uh, that we're relying on in terms of particularly the internet. And I just sort of explained to you some of, the, some of the difficulties about actually understanding who's doing what to whom or under what circumstances. A lot of our, a lot of our information is of that intelligence nature. It's certainly not evidence. And when you add to this, the rather clunky procedures around extradition and mutual assistance, which I think somebody must have invented in the 19th century sometime who had plenty of time on their hands, you can begin to see how difficult it is for traditional law enforcement to succeed. It makes even more starkly um, successful what um, Tony's people have achieved in relation to this Romanian matter. So there is also the issue of how effective penalties are for those caught and prosecuted. It's a bit of a difficulty getting the judges at the moment to understand that this is not some um, anodyne sort of thing which you just sort of slap somebody on the wrist. This is actually has enormous effects um, on the infrastructure and the confidence in markets uh, around the world. I don't think people get it. I don't think the judges yet get it that this is about a psychic thing about the security of doing business on the internet. Um, and that's something where we, we've got a huge amount of education, I think, to do. Um, but if I'm right about all of that stuff, then um, there's a real problem about whether the criminal law is actually acting as a deterrent. Because you know the fundamental deterrent value of the criminal law is the probability you're going to get caught. Now, it's almost, it's almost certain you're not going to get caught. Um, the way, the way the world is working at the moment. Despite the best endeavours of law enforcement agencies, um, the likelihood of being caught is pretty low. Um, so I, I think we need a paradigm shift in the way we look at 
and deal with cybercrime, particularly serious and organised crime, the sort that we were seeing in that Romanian case. It's a shift that we have already set out in our organised crime strategic framework, uh, dealing with organised crime in that case more generally, and it's a shift necessitated primarily, I think, by the global nature of criminality and also by some of the issues around, um, around anonymity. But it's a shift that's already occurring within Australia and other like-minded countries. We need to articulate it better and, and more often and get more people on the wagon so that, uh, so what are the main features of this paradigm shift that I'm talking about? Let me just list, list them. First, and, and this, is not, this is not rocket science. I'm sure a lot of you actually who thought about this subject would come to the same conclusion. But first is good intelligence is vital. I cannot overstate how critical this is. Uh, we need to understand the threats and vulnerabilities that confront us on the internet. And that's why, for example, we, the AFP, the, the Australian Crime Commission, ASIC, all the state and Commonwealth law enforcement agencies have been arguing so hard to renovate the telecommunications interception legislation. And that's just one piece of the puzzle, but it's a vital piece of the puzzle in terms of intelligence. The level of intelligence and information, a lot of work is in train between police, intelligence agencies, ISPs, financial institutions. Importantly, a network of um, what, what are known as CERTs, computer emergency response teams, beginning to provide a source of information about cyber threats across public and private organisations around the world. It's a very interesting phenomenon, but it's beginning to become uh, a very powerful network for understanding and in clearinghouse for information about the vulnerabilities and threats um, around the world. We're also developing a national online reporting facility for cybercrime. Um, the Australian Cybercrime Online Reporting Network, or ACORN for short. Uh, Australia is admittedly dragging the chain a bit on this. Some of our counterparts in Canada, the United States, the UK, even New Zealand already have something like this. But ACORN would provide a central point for members of the public to report cybercrime incidents of whatever sort and which would be referred to the relevant agency for consideration and action. So it's a sort of a, a collecting point, a portal, and then you would triage the types of uh, complaints or uh, reports that come in. In addition to helping uh, to address the current confusion about how and to whom to report cybercrime, it will help to create a clearer picture of the scope and nature of the cybercrime problem facing Australia. The capacity to bring together a range of financial, logistic and criminal intelligence to fuse the data, as we say, also enables us to take preventative action and to mitigate threats and disrupt criminal syndicates and plans. And that's the second element that I want to emphasise. That's the second element. Prevention and mitigation is critical here. It should be clear from what I've said that target hardening and prevention is going to be of the essence. I'm talking about prevention in a very expansive and sophisticated sense, uh, not talking about just putting cameras up and stuff like that. This is actually, uh, for example, the work that we've been doing over the last decade on critical infrastructure is relevant to criminal intrusions and attacks, just as much as resilience in the face of terrorist attacks and natural hazards. That work is, and that planning for resilience for business and infrastructure is critical. Um, and, and this is, a, I think, a, a critical element in um, what I'm saying is the new paradigm in terms of relation to cybercrime. Uh, prevention, widely conceived, um, planning for resilience of individuals and businesses. So the third, the third thing I want to talk about, implicit in what I've already said, I think, um, this engagement needs to be much broader than law enforcement agencies and public sector agencies. Within government uh, and businesses, there needs to be a real concerted effort and real partnerships. Many of the key assets, as I said, are privately owned. Much of the key intelligence is privately obtained. And let me give you an example of what the sort of thing that I'm talking about here. There's currently an arrangement with ISPs called the I-Code, Code of Practice, to deal with uh, hygiene of internet users. I don't mean their own personal hygiene, I mean their computers. Um, in signing up to the I-Code, the ISPs 
commit to take steps when their customers are infected with malware through a process of advice and education, or even to temporarily quarantine the customer's service by placing them within a walled garden um, with links to resources that will assist restore the security of their machine. And this is a voluntary arrangement, essentially done under force of contract. That is, that is the type of arrangement and the type of, um, it's, a para, it's, a, it's a microcosm of the type of arrangement I think we're going, going to be increasingly looking at in order to try and deal with issues around cybercrime. Uh, what it illustrates is that government action is not the ultimate solution. A partnership is required. And more than that, the ultimate solution to online safety and security, I think, is going to have to do with business models, business incentives, and the de development of new technology. Regulation, I think, is going to have a minimal role. And self-interest and innovation, innovation is going to be much more important. And that's becoming obvious wherever you look. When I look at things like the problems around copyright and copyright piracy, and I've been doing a lot of work with the the ISPs and the copyright owners around that. It's pretty obvious that the solution to that is not going to be government regulation, which is going to be clunky and overtaken by technology fairly rapidly, but it is going to be technological changes, technological advances, and changes in business models on both sides of that equation, different arrangements between copyright owners and ISPs. So through incentives, I think government can do a lot to encourage those who are in the best interest, in the best position to, controlled, to control the risks. And I've been um, going around and talking to business over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, talking to the state governments about protective security. Uh, protective security, I think, is really, really important. It's important as a, as a part of, uh, an integral part of your business planning. And, and explaining to people uh, the different components of protective security as we see it in the Commonwealth, uh, we, as we understand it in terms of security in relation to people, places and information. Um, not actually stuffing it down people's throats, but just saying to business, this is how we do things. Um, as a CEO or a chairman of a board, you need to think about this stuff. You need to think about how it's going to play, how much money is it worth to you to get this right, etc. And I think that's the sort of role that government can play. I mean, we can get much more um, prescriptive. Uh, the Americans in Congress are thinking about trying to prescribe certain standards of protective security, if you want to think of it that way, for some of their critical infrastructure and some of their critical companies. We haven't gone down that track. And in terms of what, and I notice that the, um, the UK has announced something similar. We haven't gone down that track. Maybe it's because we've got a smaller sector that we can deal with. But I think purveying this concept of protective security, setting up trusted information sharing networks and allowing people to exchange information and to understand what best practice is, is a, probably a more productive way of proceeding. And there are some natural um, incentives and synergies, I think, that we can actually harness in that respect. The fourth thing um, uh, that I want to emphasize this type of engagement of partnership will also involve international relationships between countries and between companies. And uh, just to hark back to the AFP operation in Romania, that was very clearly um, at least a relationship between the AFP and the Romanian police, uh, but probably more widely between Interpol and Europol, I would imagine, and probably involved a lot of players. But that type um, as I mentioned at the outset, the internet creates opportunities for forum shopping and regulatory arbitrage. So how we collectively deal with that phenomenon will be critical to the future of the internet. It's fair to say that there are two schools of thought emerging. I was in London at that conference that Haig set up where we were talking really about how you deal with this problem of regulatory arbitrage. One school of thought, which is represented by China and Russia, I guess you'd say, is that uh, government should agree to collectively regulate the internet. That's, we should set up a, a governance system and we should regulate the internet. In fact, my counterpart in China, the Minister for Propaganda, um, told me that, you know, that the obvious thing to do was that you had to use your real name on the internet, that you wouldn't be allowed to access it 
unless you used your real name. Um, the other school of thought, uh, which is represented, I guess, by the US, the UK, um, Australia, certainly, and some of the Europeans that have bought into this issue, um, views that as impractical, if not undesirable as well, and that it would effectively kill off the best features of the internet. And um, play, we place more emphasis on the development of technology and new business models to deal with the problems of crime, safety and security. Um, and um, because of the global nature of the internet though, there does need to be some radical rethinking, I think, of the different levels of cooperation in rulemaking and rule enforcement at the international level. I'm not talking about the regulation of the internet, but I am talking about looking at some of the standards that apply to things like content that is on the internet. So it's fairly, it's fair to say that there, that this is widely understood, although perhaps not yet, how radical this engagement is going to have to be. It will take more than the usual agreement to implement laws. It will take more than the usual use of mutual assistance agreements. It will require genuine joint effort. Um, the Council of Europe's Convention on Cybercrime represents a first step in this direction. It's an important convention that requires signatories to get their domestic law in shape and put in place some measures to enable greater collection and exchange of information. And we have been pushing this Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime, not because we want to suddenly become a member of the, of the Council of Europe, but because it's really the only thing going around which encapsulates the type of, uh, the type of requirements you would want all civilised countries to sign up to. So there is actually some, some flaw that we're not going to sort of uh, uh, fall, fall lower than in terms of the, the uh, um, prevention of crime. And, the, and, the, and, and uh, Australia has been at the forefront of pushing that into the Pacific and in Asia uh, with, the, with the US um, and the UK trying to push it in, in Europe as well um, as, as a key instrument in terms of trying to get some agreement around the minimal requirements in terms of the criminalisation of activities that we would expect in various, uh, various countries. Um, so this will help make cooperation between nation states easier and will reduce the safe havens for cyber criminals, what I call regulatory arbitrage. And we're acceding to the convention. We expect to be a party um, on the 1st of March 2013, I think we're, we're expecting to actually formally become a party to the treaty. Um, so the fifth thing I wanted to talk about, a key component of any response to serious crime will be innovation in the capability and capacity of law enforcement authorities to respond. Many more people in the room are more expert on this than, than me, including Tony Negus. So, but um, the recent response to offshore investment Fordsters is an example of non-traditional response. Based on initial indications, more than 2,600 Australians have fallen victim to these fraudsters with total losses in excess of $113 million. We have a very clear picture of how they operate. They create fake brokerage firms and websites to spruik their investment. They impersonate financial regulators to convince um, their victims they have a financial services certificate. They even manipulate search engine results to hide negative stories. These are people who have never been to Australia and will never come to Australia. In response, the Australian Crime Commission with the AFP and others is leading a multi-agency task force to disrupt these operations and the criminal groups behind them. And this re represents a focus on tr non-traditional enforcement techniques and disruption and prevention rather than prosecutions. This approach relies on close cooperation with industry, particularly the banking, finance and superannuation sectors, internet service providers, community organisations, to develop strategies to prevent and disrupt serious and organised fraud. Spoken about the use of intelligence, there are also important aspects of the internet, for example, anonymity that can be utilised to infiltrate and disrupt criminal activities. Um, and that, can, that can, is something that law enforcement agencies can use um, to their uh, uh, 
used to their advantage. Critical two, I think, uh, is the pursuit of profits. I haven't got really time to speak about some of those issues. Uh, more controversial is the extent to which and the circumstances under which uh, police, for example, should be able to take down a threatening site or a site where there is intelligence um, or evidence that they uh, this, this site may be up to no good. But I think there's an outstanding question um, here about uh, the capacity uh, of law enforcement agencies to take prophylactic action on the basis of intelligence and not on the basis of strict proof. Um, why do I say that? Well, if, if we don't come up or devise a system whereby, I don't know, for example, um, the AFP could go to the Attorney General with a warrant and say, listen, we think there's this site in Nigeria or wherever that's actually up to no good, is about to sort of uh, rip off all these Australians. Uh, we, we need to, authority to take it down. We can do that. We have the technological capacity to do that. If we don't devise a system like that, then I suspect that we will simply get that being privatised, that function. And, you know, banks can easily access what are now being called dark markets, and they can buy that expertise in the marketplace. And that should, basically what you will get is a type of vigilantism. So I think there are some, some, some key questions which go to the very heart of the way in which the criminal the system of criminal law works in Western-style countries uh, that need to be contemplated and which are being brought to the fore by, by cyber and by cyber crime of that sort. Um, and similarly, I think some of the issues around identity are really going to be critical. If there was one, this is about organised crime as well as about cyber crime, but if there's one question that sits at the centre of um, you ask, I think, law enforcement agencies or any of the police that are sitting around or intelligence agencies, what, what is the critical thing that you would really want to sort out? It is questions around identity and around biometrics, and around being some clarity around people actually knowing who people are, actually being able to be clear and identify them. So anonymity and the anonymity of the internet is one of the critical issues, I think, that we need to confront. Um, so in summary, uh, let me just sort of quickly list the things that I think are part of, a, of a, um, a strategy in relation to cybercrime. Collecting, analysing and surveying intelligence around threats and vulnerabilities. Um, encouraging, facilitating, providing incentives for businesses and community to understand risks and do what they can to, to and what they can to mitigate them, understanding what they can do to mitigate them. Um, governments creating conditions for international cooperation to minimise forum shopping and regulatory arbitrage. Um, we need uh, to avoid, I think, regulating the internet um, uh, and encourage, we need to encourage and facilitate innovative technology and business models that prevent or mitigate crime rather than relying on regulation. Um, I think in partnership with the private sector, government needs to be um, consider new ways to combat and disrupt criminal activity. And that may include, even as I said, calling into question some of the very central norms and traditional norms of the criminal law. And, um, I, and finally, I think government should be setting an example in terms of protective security, uh, crime prevention and procurement. So there's some of the components that I would see as part of a response to this new paradigm, in a sense, of um, cybercrime. Um, I might uh, leave it at that and take questions or comments. Actually, okay, thanks.